Janet and I have been married for 12 years, and we've been together since we were 10. College didn't appeal to me, so right after high school, I started working at Desmond Engineering as a draftsman at the bottom rung. A year after we got married, Janet and I welcomed twin girls, Bethany and Brittany, making us incredibly proud parents. The initial years were tough, but by being careful with our spending, we managed to get by. I was still working as a draftsman, but had moved up a few levels, which meant a slightly better income, though money was still tight. We saved enough to buy a small house and had two reliable cars. They weren't brand new, but they were far from being clunkers. Janet had always dreamed of being a stay-at-home mom, and since we could manage financially, she didn't work outside the home. This arrangement worked well for us. We were both healthy and fit. Janet had gained a little weight since our wedding day but not much. She was petite, a little over five feet tall, with dark brown hair she styled with bangs, reminding me of Marie Osmond. I looked pretty much the same as when I played right tackle in high school football. I was big, but not out of shape. Billy Martin, a former football rival, moved to Reading from Lancaster about a year ago and started working at Desmond Engineering as a surveyor. Billy and I quickly became good friends. He too married his high school sweetheart, Sarah, a redhead. Sarah and Janet hit it off right away, becoming fast friends. Billy and Sarah hadn't started a family yet, but they were excellent at looking after kids. Billy and I would hang out together when we weren't working, enjoying a bit of time away from our spouses. Janet and Sarah did the same, spending their time shopping, attending parties, and going to club meetings while Billy and I took care of the kids and watched TV. Sarah landed a secretary job at Gilbert Engineering, not far from our town. About six months ago, I began to notice some changes. The parent-teacher association meetings, which used to be monthly, became weekly events. Even though Sarah didn't have children, she always accompanied Janet. The number of Tupperware and Magic Chef parties they attended seemed to increase every month, yet they never purchased anything. They joined a book club but hardly ever read any books. On weekends they spent hours shopping but came back with very little. Meanwhile, Janet's fancy lingerie collection was expanding, though I never saw any of it. These observations started to bother me, but I kept my concerns to myself because Billy appeared completely unaware and I didn't want to stir up any trouble unnecessarily. One night, after I had put our daughters to bed, Janet returned from some basket party. She showered before leaving with Sarah, and again immediately after returning home. It struck me as odd. While Janet was showering, I decided to look through the laundry and found a pair of black lace underwear. It made me wonder who would wear such a thing to a basket party. Normally, I wouldn't dream of inspecting my wife's undergarments, but that evening, Curiosity got the better of me, and I noticed they were damp and sticky. I pocketed them. I had never rummaged through my wife's purse or wallet before, but that night, I felt compelled to check, especially her cell phone. It seemed she hadn't expected me to look because her call history from the past week was intact. Most calls were to Sarah, but there were also many calls to and from numbers labeled KC, KH, and KW. I didn't initially know who these were, but figured that C stood for cell, H for home, and W probably for work. In her address book, Sarah's numbers were listed similarly, Sarah C, Sarah H, and Sarah W, showing how organized my wife kept her contacts. Sarah's work number included an extension, and when I compared it to the KW number, it matched Sarah's but with a different extension. It was clear then that Janet had been in touch with someone at Sarah's workplace, and that Sarah likely introduced them. With Gilbert Engineering closed, I decided to use Janet's phone to dial the KW number. The voicemail of Kin Sanders greeted me, explaining he was away from his desk but would return calls if I left my details. I quickly hung up after the message. It seemed too straightforward. Since Gilbert Engineering was closed, I used Janet's phone to dial the KW number and reached Kin Sanders' voicemail. I quickly hung up after hearing the message to leave a contact detail for a callback. This felt too simple. Janet peeked in, asking if I was heading to bed soon. I told her I might finish my book or just fall asleep on the couch, though I planned to stay there all night. It turned out to be a night full of restlessness as I pondered over any mistakes I might have made or what could have been done differently, realizing it was futile. Despite trying to focus on the future, my mind kept dwelling on past actions. The clock seemed to stand still. I decided not to blame myself for anything that had happened or was about to happen. In the morning, 
I woke up to the sound of our daughters preparing their breakfast, a self-reliance Janet had encouraged, which was proving effective. As I got up and Janet reminded me about work, I informed her I wouldn't be going due to personal issues, surprising her since I rarely missed a day. Feeling exhausted, I mentioned needing a shower, leaving Janet looking somewhat puzzled. By the time I returned, the girls had already headed off to school. I grabbed a coffee and sat down opposite my wife at the table. She glanced up at me, seeming to expect something yet unsure what it was. I decided to confront the issue directly. I want to know about the affair you're having. I wasn't in the mood for subtlety, and I doubted she'd just come clean. Really, John? Is that why you've been so down? Do you honestly believe I'm having an affair? She asked. Yes, I do. Now, let's talk about your affair, I pressed. We've been together for 12 years, John. Why would you think that? She questioned. Janet, I'm busy today and I don't want to waste time playing games. Just tell me about the affair, I insisted. Janet sighed heavily, leaning in. John, you're imagining things. There's no affair. I'd like to believe you, but I can't, I responded, skeptical of her denial. She leaned back, sipping her coffee confidently. What do you want to ask me, John? Why do you claim to attend PTA meetings weekly, when the PTA secretary said they're only monthly, and you haven't attended any in six months? I asked, seeing her confidence waver. I don't know what you mean, she faltered, her assurance fading. You and Sarah claim to go to these PTA meetings every Tuesday. Why lie about that? I pushed further. After a brief pause, Janet admitted, I'm sorry, John. Tuesday is ladies' night at Rosie's Cantina and Sarah and I have going for the two-for-one margaritas. We didn't want you and Billy to worry about us possibly causing trouble, so we kept it to ourselves. I admit it was a mistake, and I apologize. From now on, we'll be more open. Well, Janet, I'll definitely be verifying that story. I'm sure Sarah will agree with you, but I wonder what the staff at Rosie's would say. John, you're making a bigger deal out of this than necessary. Why do you shower before and after these parties? Why the need to remove smells only when you return? She hesitated before answering. Many women there smoke, and I don't like the smell lingering on me. And the fancy lingerie for Tupperware parties? You never dress up like that for me unless it's a special occasion. What's the reason for that? I don't really have a good reason. I guess I just like feeling fancy when I go out. I was losing patience with her evasions. I couldn't keep my anger in check anymore. These are the underwear you wore last night, I said, throwing them on the table. They were damp and sticky when you got home. Don't even try to excuse it as something trivial. Janet looked uncomfortable and avoided eye contact, unable to respond quickly. Why did you come home in underwear like that, Janet? I need a real answer. Enough, John. I can't handle this anymore. We've been married 12 years. Why are you doing this? Her continuous denials and lies overwhelmed me. In frustration, I threw my coffee cup, breaking the microwave. That certainly got her attention, revealing an expression I'd never seen before. She'd never witnessed me this angry. I leaned forward, making sure I had her full attention, and raised my voice more than usual. Who is Kin Sanders? She quickly stood up and retreated to the sink, trying to distance herself from me. For the last time, who is Kin Sanders? I demanded. A friend, just a friend, she replied, visibly terrified. Did you sleep with him? I asked sternly. Yes, I did, she admitted. Did it happen last night? I pressed on. Yes, it did, she confirmed. Please, John, stop. I'm sorry, just please stop, she pleaded, tears streaming down her face by the sink. I grabbed a cup, poured myself a new coffee, and was about to sit when Janet's phone rang. Her gaze flicked between the phone and me in panic. It's from Ken. We should answer it, I said, hitting the speakerphone button. Good morning, sugar. I saw you called my work number last night. Did you forget something at my place? The voice of Kin Sanders came through. Janet looked horrified. After a brief silence, Janet, are you there? What's wrong? He asked. She glanced at me, frozen. I urged her to speak. Kin, my husband knows. He's listening on speaker, she managed to say. Kin didn't respond or hang up. Feeling it was my turn, I addressed Kin casually, hinting at a visit later and suggesting he might want to be prepared for emergencies. I hung up, pocketed the phone, and looked at Janet, who was still by the sink in her bathrobe, shaking uncontrollably. I need to leave now, I said, exiting the tense scene. I need to ask you one more thing. Who's the guy Sarah's involved with? I asked. 
John, please, I don't want to say, she pleaded. In frustration, I threw another cup across the room where it shattered against the wall. Startled, she quickly said, Calvin, Calvin Bostick, I'll be back later. Make sure you've moved out by then. My mom will look after our daughters until we figure out what to do next. If it doesn't fit in your car, I'll make sure it gets to you. Just tell my mom where you're going, and don't try to contact me. She was silent as I left. Confused about my next steps, I decided to visit Billy at work, thinking he deserved to know what was happening. It seemed clear that Sarah and Calvin became close through work, and Ken was likely Calvin's friend who got set up with Janet. Simplistic, maybe, but it seemed to fit the situation. Billy wasn't at the office, so I called him. Billy, I've got some bad news, I started. Is anyone hurt? He asked, alarmed. Not yet, but it's a mess. Janet and Sarah have been seeing other guys instead of going to those meetings and parties, I explained. Billy was skeptical at first. I don't buy it, John. Sounds like nonsense. I suggested he ask Sarah about Calvin Bostick from her workplace, hinting she might have introduced Janet to Ken Sanders, another co-worker. I know both of them, Billy said, recognizing the names. I warned him that Janet would likely warn Sarah, and he should expect to hear excuses just like I did from Janet. Billy ended the call, and I went to HR to ask for some time off. I wasn't in the mood to work. It was quick to transfer my ongoing projects to another draftsman. Then, Janet's phone rang, showing Sarah's caller ID. Janet, what's going on? Billy just called me. He's headed to the office, and I think he heard something, Sarah said. I stayed silent. Janet, this isn't the time for jokes, she pressed. Hi, Sarah. This is John. I'm using Janet's phone since mine was out of battery. What's up? What did you say to Billy? I couldn't resist adding a bit of edge to the situation. Oh, John, sorry, I thought this was Janet. I'll try her at home, Sarah said, flustered. Don't bother. She's busy packing up her things. No time to talk, I informed her. Packing? What do you mean? Sarah asked, confused. She's moving back with her parents for a bit, I explained. The silence on her end was telling. I suggested, maybe you should warn Calvin that Billy knows and is on his way. He might appreciate a heads up. Oh no, this is really happening, Sarah panicked before abruptly hanging up. I couldn't believe her nerve. Canceling our only credit card was straightforward, and changing the pin for our ATM debit card took just a few minutes. However, I was unsure what to do about our joint checking account. So I decided to leave it alone for the moment, since I needed access to the account to pay for utilities and other bills. I just hoped Janet hadn't taken any checks with her. My cell phone rang, but this time it was my own. Billy had confronted Calvin Bostick at Gilbert Engineering and caught him in the parking lot. Calvin ended up in jail, and Billy wanted me to call his brother in Lancaster to bail him out. After making the call, there wasn't much more I could do for Billy, so I grabbed lunch at Taco Bell. Later I visited my parents and filled them in on everything. My mom agreed to help with the girls, staying at my house during the week and having the twins over on weekends. Next, I decided to pay a visit to Kin Sanders. The drafting team at Gilbert was eager to share the morning's drama. From their vantage point, they had witnessed Billy tackling Calvin before he could get to his BMW, then pinning him against a car and hitting him. Security struggled to intervene and eventually used a taser on Billy. Both Billy and Calvin ended up in the custody of the authorities, with Calvin needing medical attention. I learned where Kin Sanders' cubicle was, but it was empty. He had apparently quit that morning. Sarah's desk seemed untouched, suggesting she still worked there. Shortly after, I had Kin's home address and was on my way there. I found a small ranch-style house with a white Lexus parked outside, its trunk and doors open. As I approached, Kin came out with a load of clothes but dropped everything and ran back inside upon seeing me. I chased after him but tripped over the clothes only to see him escaping out the back. I couldn't help but laugh at his panicked reaction. I decided not to worry about the checking account right then since I needed it to pay the bills anyway. I just hoped Janet hadn't taken any checks with her. My cell phone rang and this time it was a call for me. Billy had confronted Calvin Bostick at Gilbert Engineering and ended up getting him arrested in the parking lot. He asked me to contact Calvin's brother in Lancaster to bail him out. After making the call, there wasn't much else I could do to help Billy, so I grabbed lunch at Taco Bell. Later I visited my parents and filled them in on everything. My mom agreed to help with the girls during this transition. 
she'd stay at my place during the week, and the twins would spend weekends with them. Next, I wanted to check on Kin Sanders. The drafting team at Gilbert had a clear view of the parking lot and had watched Billy's confrontation with Calvin. They told me Billy had physically subdued Calvin until security intervened with a taser. They also mentioned that Kin Sanders had quit unexpectedly that morning, and Sarah was absent from her desk, but still employed there. I managed to get Kin's home address and headed over. His house looked rented and was about to be vacated. I hoped to talk to Kin but didn't intend to chase him. Inside, I found his cell phone, passport, and personal documents on a desk, along with a laptop on the dining table. I took these items and left, avoiding any actions that could be seen as criminal, though I couldn't resist deflating one of his car tires for a bit of mischief. I stopped by the jail to see Billy, but he was busy with legal matters, so I just greeted him and left. At home, my mom was already making dinner. I brought Ken's belongings to my den, but was interrupted by my daughters returning from school. Before I could explain the situation, Bethany asked about their grandma's presence and where their mom was. I had to simplify the situation, telling them their mom and I were taking a break from each other. She's going to stay with her grandparents for a bit. Brittany broke into a grin, while Beth just sighed heavily. I knew it! I was right! Brittany was clearly proud of her prediction, and Beth looked annoyed. What's the joke here? I asked, puzzled. Brittany was eager to share. Beth and I had a bet. I guessed that mom was being unfaithful and Beth thought that was impossible. Looks like I won. I never specifically mentioned mom cheating, I clarified. Dad, we're not naive. Please don't treat us like we are. It's obvious what's happening, Brittany interjected, with Beth agreeing that their mom was indeed cheating. How did you guys know? I was taken aback. Dad, you're a bit too trusting. It's kind of obvious, Brittany said, putting her arm around me in an attempt to comfort me, which felt strange coming from a 12-year-old. One time, Mom and Sarah said they were going on an adults-only shopping trip and wouldn't let us come. Later, some kids at school claimed they saw her with another man, and they even had a photo to prove it, Brittany explained. Why didn't you tell me sooner? I asked, shocked. They both just shrugged. Then, a few weeks later, Tracy Mercer's parents saw Mom, Sarah, and some men at a restaurant. They told Tracy, Brittany added. I was speechless, just in time for dinner to be called. We didn't talk about the issue during the meal, and I excused myself early. Thankfully, the twins didn't bring it up again that night, giving me a much-needed break from the topic. As I began to explore Kin's laptop, his cell phone received a text message. It read, DK's free, sorry for the mess, love, Janet. I'm not great at texting, but this message was clear to me. It came from Sarah's phone, indicating that Sarah and Janet were together. I replied with, TJ, thanks, John, letting her know I had Kin's phone. I spent a few hours going through Kin's computer, finding no emails between Janet and Kin, but some intriguing ones between Kin and his old friends in Lancaster. What I discovered shocked me. Despite being with Janet nearly her entire life, it felt like she had grown closer to Kin in just a year than to me in nearly two decades. At one point, while changing the printer cartridge, I realized I was crying, something unusual for me. Janet's betrayal had cut deep, adding insult to injury. I printed out several emails and photos, limited by the amount of special paper I had. The images were all decent, nothing inappropriate. Then, Beth peeked in and asked to call her mom. I couldn't deny her request. While my mom was with Beth and Britt as they talked to Janet, she ended up hearing the entire conversation. She wasn't trying to listen in on purpose, but the twins weren't exactly being secretive. My mom later told me that the girls were pretty straightforward with Janet, holding her responsible for all the issues. Their talk was brief, under five minutes. The emails revealed some juicy details. Kin had landed a job as an engineer on a renewable energy project in Spain and was supposed to start in six weeks. It seemed he hadn't informed his current job at Gilbert about his departure, which Sarah might have known, but no one else at the company did. He had everything sorted for his move, except now, I had his passport. Getting a new one would be his best move, although he'd have to act fast to meet his start date. It was unlikely he'd report the passport stolen to the police, considering the circumstances. He hadn't booked his flight yet. One email to a friend shed light on a lot. Janet was planning to divorce me once she moved to Spain with Kin. She figured I wouldn't let her take the twins abroad, 
and planned to have me declared an unfit father to prevent me from having visitation or custody. Ken wrote the email, so it was his word. But I wished I had something directly from Janet. I printed several copies of this email for safekeeping. Mom dozed off while watching late-night TV, so I suggested she head to bed. The girls were already asleep. I ended up crashing on the couch, surrounded by empty beer bottles. The next morning, the aroma of fresh coffee and bacon woke me up. My mom always made a great breakfast. The girls were nearly done with their cereal when I joined them at the table. Bracing myself for their playful teasing before I could even think about addressing the situation with my soon-to-be ex-wife. Before the girls left for the bus, I gently explained that their mom might try to push me out of their lives by labeling me as an unfit parent, aiming to keep them all to herself. I reassured them I was open to shared custody, because their happiness mattered most, but I wouldn't give up my right to be a part of their lives. I didn't want them to feel torn, but it was important they knew the truth. I urged them to stay sharp and ignore any falsehoods. Dad, we're more perceptive than you think. Don't stress. We love mom, but we won't let her harm you or us, they assured me, with Brittany grinning and Beth giving a supportive thumbs up as they departed. My mom refilled my coffee and joined me with her own, comforting me that I had everyone's support. After getting ready and dressing a bit nicer than usual, I felt strange carrying three cell phones, reminding myself to buy a charger for Ken's phone. I'd rather be overprepared. At the family services office, I felt awkward when called by a caseworker I recognized from high school, Jody Mitchell, once a goth girl known for her distinct style. Despite our different high school circles where goths were often isolated, Jody looked quite ordinary now, though I still remembered her for her pink hair streak, black lipstick, and heavy makeup. Goths back then were often misunderstood, leaving us guessing about their true interests. Regarding Jody, it was likely none of those wild rumors were true, but back then, we tended to believe the most sensational stories. The nameplate on her desk read, J. Mitchell, leading me to think she hadn't married. It made sense 12 years ago, but looking at her now, she seemed different. John, how can I help you? Jody's question snapped me out of my thoughts, causing me to stutter a bit. You look great, Jody, I managed to say, which made her laugh at my clumsiness. Do you mean compared to my goth days? She asked, making me feel even more awkward. Sort of, but I didn't mean it in a bad way, I tried to clarify. Jody reassured me, explaining that by mid-college, she realized she didn't need to hide behind a goth facade and had been living as her true self for nearly a decade. I apologized for sounding condescending, admitting I often say the wrong thing. Jody brushed it off, eager to get to the reason for my visit. I asked if she had any files on me, to which she quickly checked and confirmed there were none under my or Janet's name, joking that it seemed we were feeding our kids and not harming them. Confirming we had twin daughters, Bethany and Brittany, age 12, I finally explained my situation. My wife planned to leave me and take our daughters. Jody wasn't surprised, noting that such situations were common in her line of work. Does she need a real reason to accuse me of something like that? I asked, noting that usually a mom would bring some proof or documentation to support her claim. Jody confirmed there was nothing in their records against me at the moment. So, how can I be sure you're not just setting me up? Maybe she hasn't reported anything yet, but is gathering evidence like medical records or police reports, I pondered, worried that the absence of records didn't prove my innocence. It sounds like you're saying I'm trapped no matter what, I concluded. Jody reassured me that wasn't necessarily the case and asked why I thought my wife would take such actions. Reluctantly, I showed Jody an email from Ken that I'd printed out, admitting I'd taken it from a computer without permission, understanding it couldn't legally be used, but still showed some evidence of their plans. I mentioned the term conspiracy without knowing its exact legal meaning, expressing my confusion and fear about protecting myself and my daughters without the means to hire a lawyer. Jody leaned back, contemplating, then asked if I could return the next morning, wanting to keep the email copy. I agreed and left, feeling a bit of kinship as we exchanged smiles, seeing Jody in a new light beyond her goth past. Faced with the possibility of divorce and uncertain finances, I randomly chose a lawyer from the phone book, paid up front in cash for a complete service package, not wanting to leave anything to chance. I instructed my lawyer to handle the divorce as quickly and simply as possible, 
letting Janet have the house since its value had dropped below what we owed on it. My main demand was at least joint custody of our daughters, aiming for full custody if possible. I agreed to pay child support, but refused to provide alimony. While heading to lunch, Billy called needing a place to stay, and I immediately offered my support. We met at Taco Bell for lunch, where he greeted me with an unusual grin. Curious, I asked what was going on. He shared that a hospital employee had updated him about Calvin. Sarah visited Calvin at the hospital, only for Calvin's unaware wife and kids to show up, causing a scene that led to Sarah being escorted out by security. Billy also mentioned Sarah had quit her job and was likely at home, though he was unsure of her whereabouts or why Calvin's family wasn't with him. Frankly, Billy didn't care about the details anymore. Billy took a week off to sort his life out, and although my mom was staying with us, we figured we'd manage his sleeping arrangements. He planned to collect his belongings from his place, hoping to avoid Sarah. My next stop was supposed to be the insurance agent, but another call interrupted me. It was Cameron Wilcox, asking me to come over and help settle things, as Janet was distressed, and her mother's presence wasn't helping. Who will be there? I asked. Cameron replied it would be the three of us along with Janet's sister, Carla. Unsure of his expectations, I agreed to arrive in 20 minutes. The mood was heavy when I got there, bringing along my folder of evidence while refusing any coffee offered. Who's going to start this? I asked. Cameron explained that Janet felt I had overreacted, accusing me of anger and making her confess to things that weren't true just to appease me. She insisted she had done nothing wrong and that I had no grounds to kick her out. It was clear Janet had given her family a very cleaned-up account of our issues. Understandably, she might not want to confess her affair to her parents, but I was frustrated she was pinning the blame on me. What do you expect from me, Cameron? To expose her lies or confess to errors I didn't make? I queried, looking for clarity. Just hoping to clarify things with some facts, he responded. What has she said about the guy she's been seeing? Cameron recounted Janet's denial of having a boyfriend, suggesting any meetings were innocent gatherings misinterpreted by me. In the past month, she's had over 80 calls with this friend. How often has she called you or her mother in that time? Their gazes shifted to Janet, who wouldn't meet their eyes. Does this sound like just a casual friend? I challenged, pulling out Ken's phone. Carla, can you read this text sent right after I confronted her? I handed her the phone, which displayed a message to Ken from Janet, expressing regret. Carla returned the phone without comment. Does this seem casual to you? There was silence. A few weeks back, Janet and Sarah claimed they were shopping at the King of Prussia Mall. The girls wanted to join but were told it was adults only. Here are some photos from that day. I showed Cameron six pictures, none of which matched their supposed location. Everyone looked troubled, especially as it was clear the images didn't align with Janet's story. That looks like Noble's Grove, not the King of Prussia Mall, Martha pointed out after being quiet until then. Janet, you're clinging to this man in every photo, which isn't how you act with just friends. It's clear that Ken is more than just a friend to you. What were you trying to do? Janet started to cry, caught off guard by the photos. I showed a few more pictures, some taken at Olive Garden and one at Red Lobster, all appropriate but clearly intimate. Cameron, visibly disappointed by the deceit, apologized for having to bring me into this situation. As I was leaving, Janet exited the room in tears. We never discussed the issue with her underwear, but it seemed unnecessary by then. Cameron apologized at the door, regretting what had happened, but assuring me it wouldn't be overlooked. When I arrived home, I found that Mom and Billy had arranged a temporary sleeping spot for him in the small room where I keep my computer. Billy had brought over a pile of his clothes from his house, noting Sarah wasn't there when he stopped by. The most notable thing at home was a piece of mail for Janet from the passport office. Despite knowing I shouldn't, curiosity got the best of me, and I opened it to find a family passport featuring Janet and our daughters, excluding me. I recalled the girls mentioning a photo session, but hadn't realized it was for this. Right away, I called Cameron to let him know Janet's passport had arrived. I told him to inform Janet she could get it if she sent Ken to my house for it, as I'd only hand it over to him. Normally, I'd have been at work and unaware of the mail, but I happened to be home that day. Cameron mentioned they had asked Janet to move out and didn't know where she'd go, showing they were quite upset with her.
he agreed to pass on the message about the passport. Dinner was lively, mainly focusing on the twins. A lady from family services visited us at school today, Bethany shared with a hint of mischief. I prodded for details, learning they spoke with Jody, a caseworker who also attended our high school. The girls teased me for playing dumb about knowing Jody and shared that she spent over an hour talking about me, which they interpreted as her having a fondness for me. Our meal was interrupted by a call from Carla, wanting to meet. At McDonald's, over hot coffees, she attempted to relay Janet's side of things. She admitted up front that her explanation might be lacking, as Janet's story seemed convoluted to her. I pointed out it sounded like she was preparing to offer excuses rather than answers. Carla acknowledged my skepticism, urging me to just listen and get it over with since I had other matters to attend to. Carla started by saying Janet blamed everything on Sarah. According to her, Sarah's affair with Billy seemed thrilling and romantic, something Janet felt she had missed out on, having only known stability and love with me. When Kin Sanders joined Gilbert, Sarah got Janet to go out with them for drinks and meals. During these outings, Sarah and Calvin often snuck away together, leaving Janet and Ken by themselves. This led to Janet and Ken starting their own affair, which quickly escalated. Janet found herself swept up by Ken's adventurous stories and ambitions, eagerly agreeing to move to Spain with him. However, she struggled with the idea of leaving the twins, knowing I wouldn't let her take them abroad. She even considered trying to portray me as an unfit father. Janet now recognizes her mistake, especially after realizing the girls were more attached to me. She's now willing to agree to a divorce without complications, provided she doesn't try to take the twins. Carla mentioned that Sarah returned to her parents' home, prompting Billy to move back to his place temporarily, with plans to sell or rent it. He spent his morning sorting out financial and legal affairs, including a visit to Gilbert to seek compensation, though their lack of a fraternization policy made it a tough case. Lastly, Billy discovered Calvin was being discharged from the hospital, running into his wife, who was handling the paperwork. Before Billy could leave, Calvin's wife approached him, explaining her efforts to have Calvin drop the charges against Billy. She even thanked Billy, surprising him by sharing her long, unsuccessful attempts to help Calvin change. After Billy left, I ended up sitting on the front porch, just drinking beer. My mom joined me with a meatloaf sandwich and a beer of her own, staying silent but keeping me company. She mentioned that my dad would be coming over for dinner and staying the night. When Jody Mitchell arrived, my mom went inside. Jody sat with me but didn't take the beer I offered. After a quiet moment, she revealed she had just served Janet the papers, describing Janet as extremely upset and currently staying with her sister. Finishing my beer, I wondered aloud why I felt so terrible about everything. Jody remarked that in situations like these, there's no real win, just scenarios that are less terrible. I considered another beer, but decided against it, asking Jody if she could talk to the twins about the situation. I worried that anything I said might come across as negative towards their mom and potentially drive a wedge between us. Jody agreed to come by at seven that evening to talk to them. As she left, she paused and looked back, sharing a smile with me, which felt like a positive sign. That night, Jody spent a good amount of time with Beth and Britt, explaining things gently. Meanwhile, Billy and I worked on clearing out his house of anything related to Sarah. After that, Jody began visiting several times a week, becoming a regular presence in our lives. Jody started spending just as much time with my mom as she did with my daughters, and I noticed she was avoiding me a bit. I was okay with it, but curious. One evening, after putting the girls to bed, she came to sit by me. Before I could say anything, she asked if I had any wine. I awkwardly replied that I only had wines with screw tops, not corks, which she found amusing. She asked for a red wine, and though it was more of a jug than a bottle, she didn't mind. As we drank, I finally brought up her visits, wondering how much longer she'd need to see the twins. She clarified that she wasn't really here for the twins, but to see me, which confused me since she barely spoke to me during her visits. I thought she was keeping her distance on purpose. She laughed off my concern about fraternization policies, then playfully suggested I should ask to see her tattoos. Surprised, I inquired about them, and she teased that finding them would be more fun, especially with a bit more wine. We both laughed as I topped off our glasses. Searching for the tattoos turned out to be thrilling, 
since we had to stay quiet to avoid waking up the girls. The fourth tattoo was hidden in a very intimate spot, which I took my time appreciating until she decided it was enough and gently pushed me away. She left early before the twins woke up, but I couldn't shake the feeling they somehow knew what went on. I instructed the lawyer I found in the phone book to finalize the divorce papers and send them to Janet. She would have to accept my terms or handle things on her own. She was living with Carla when the papers were delivered, but I didn't hear anything back, not even a phone call. Weeks went by without any word. My dad's health was declining, causing my mom to spend more time with him than at my house. With school ending, the twins stayed with her over the summer, which ended with my dad moving into an assisted living facility. Billy and I helped my mom prepare our family home for sale, and then she moved back in with me. Throughout the summer, Jody kept visiting the girls at my mom's and started spending several nights a week at my place. The girls enjoyed outings and meals with her, and I was pleased they were receiving so much attention. I was no longer feeling envious. It was clear they understood what was happening between Jody and me. Janet barely called the twins, once a week at most, with the calls sounding forced and brief, often not even mentioned to me by the twins. Billy finalized his divorce from Sarah, but I was unclear about the status of my own divorce. Billy was looking to start a surveying business and wanted me as a partner, but I was short on funds until my mom stepped in to help. After realizing Medicare would eventually cover my dad's expenses, my mom suggested using their savings to invest in the new business Billy and I were starting. She saw it as not just helping out, but also investing in our future. Within three months, Billy and I got our surveying business off the ground, where my drafting skills proved useful for creating plot drawings. When school resumed, Janet unexpectedly met with the twins, instead of them seeing Jody at the guidance office, which disappointed them. Despite trying to remain polite, their meeting with Janet was strained. She expressed her love and regret over how things turned out, mentioning her plans to visit Spain and promising postcards, yearly birthday calls, and Christmas gifts. The girls were upset when she left. Janet didn't inform me about her departure, but her parents visited the following week to apologize for her actions without making excuses. They expressed a desire to stay in the twins' lives, which I was open to. Carla, caught between her sister and her parents, felt too ashamed to face me. My divorce was finalized two months later. To celebrate, Jody and I enjoyed a rare dinner out at Red Lobster, leaving the twins at home. They seemed okay with it, perhaps even happy for us. We ended up staying overnight at the local Holiday Inn. When I returned home at 10 in the morning, the twins were visibly excited. They didn't say much but spent the entire day with huge smiles. A year into running our business successfully, my father passed away. My mom considered moving to Florida to be with her sister, but hesitated because of the twins. The girls thought it was a good idea for grandma to move, suggesting Jody could fill in for her, despite not being as skilled in the kitchen. They also mentioned they were ready for separate bedrooms, clearly planning ahead. The girls received birthday cards from their mom, but no phone call, along with numerous postcards featuring Spanish windmills, the significance of which was unclear to me. For Christmas, they got beautiful embroidered dresses that were too small, thanks to a growth spurt, but they didn't seem to mind. Gilbert Engineering turned into our largest client. Billy found some comfort knowing Calvin had shifted careers to teach electronics at a local vocational school, a step down from his previous role. He was single again, while Sarah had remarried and moved to California. Ken Sanders didn't stay long at his new job abroad and was back in the States, though his current whereabouts were unclear. Billy even reached out to his high school alumni network to try to track him down. My best friend thought I was too lenient with Ken. Interestingly, the twins continued to receive postcards featuring windmills, but the messages were always vague with no real updates. Cameron mentioned Janet had called a few times, now working at a travel agency in Barcelona, but she didn't bring up Ken or explain what had happened between them. Jody and I eloped to Maryland for a low-key wedding. Within a year, we were expecting a child, which thrilled Brittany and Bethany. They joked about having a little goth sister, a private laugh they shared with Jody but kept from me.